Okay, our next speaker is Kegiwe Mbata from CSRR. Again, I think it's fair enough to read the title of a presentation up on the screen or on the piece of paper. Can I talk this out? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. I'll be presenting to you some of the insights from my master's um, project. Um, as part of the course that I was doing at UCT called Conservation Biology. Basically, um, my project entailed trying to test if it could be possible to move beyond binary planning to a multifunctional approach in landscape management and the data uh, needed to be able to do this. I would like to just start off by saying thank you very much to my supportive supervisors and the Engangala Grassland Program for all the assistance during the project. I think yesterday and today, most of the people that gave talks here um, really gave a good background as to the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem services. But I will just uh, kind of like reiterate that functional ecosystems are needed and they are underpinned by biodiversity. And ecosystem services are goods and services that humans derive directly or indirectly uh, from nature. Although I think by now you, you internalize and I think everybody here appreciate biodiversity and ecosystem services, but I think most of you will agree with me that these features, although they're important, they do not exist anyway in isolation. They exist in a matrix of land uses and which I think needs a much more integrated approach as to how they could best be managed or conserved in a much more efficient way. And also, there are usually um, trade-offs associated with multiple ecosystem services in the landscape. To elaborate on that, in an agricultural system, you find a bundle of ecosystem services where you could find a whole lot of concentration of provisioning ecosystem services, but these services could come at a cost to other equally important ecosystem services, um, the regulating and cultural services, and the inverse is true for natural ecosystems. For my project, I tried to explore these ideas using a, a conservation planning tool, and I will get into more details as I carry on. So the aim of my project, it was just a three-month project as part of the course, as I, I explained, because it was a course with masters, so I did it in three months, and loving numbers and maths, I went and explored. So the aim of my project was to explore, was to explore the use of a a mainly used conservation planning software maximum with zones in examining trade-offs that are associated with livestock production on biodiversity and ecosystem services in the Ngangala grassland. We looked at net methane protection, net sediment protection, and annual base flow, and most of these services have already been uh, touched on today, so I won't go into detail. The study was undertaken in the Engangala grasslands. The Engangala grasslands is a very beautiful area found uh, sandwiched between three provinces, Mpumalanga, KZN, and Free State. The area is important for many of the activities that are happening there, and we, we thought it could be very interesting if we could try and understand how we could best um, conserve biodiversity in an agricultural landscape. The area is also uh, covered by at least 78% of natural vegetation, making it a very effective carbon sink and also can contribute substantially to um, livestock production. The area is also acknowledged to be key for water production of the country because three of the major rivers supplying water in most strategic areas in South Africa um, pass through these areas, or at least tributaries pass through this area. The area is also under severe development pressure from land uses such as mining and agriculture. And finally, it's important for biodiversity conservation because it's endowed with such high concentration of rare and endangered species. And also only 2% of this area is under formal protection. So now I will try and unpack this tool. Sorry, I will just get too much into detail here and I will really appreciate some questions at the end because I'm trying to see if it could work in a practical context. As I said, I, I used Maxine with zones. Maxine with zones is an extension of a well-known conservation planning software called Maxine. What it does, Maxine, it tries to meet conservation uh, target while minimizing different costs and it makes use of some brain that it has called simulated algorithm. So in most conservation planning tools, a parcel of land or a planning unit can contribute other fully um, to a conservation objectives 
or not at all. But uh, I think you will agree with me that even moderately utilized areas in the landscape could, could still have a contribution to conservation, which is why I explored Maxemi zones, because it has an added functionality to, to, to Maxen in that it recognizes multifunctionality in a landscape and one can be able to um, allocate multiple zones, each with its own cost, targets and objectives. So now I will take you through the nitty gritty of all the matter I had to go through, but I tried to distill it to a state where you could at least understand what I'm trying to say. We first had to decide on a unit of measurement. And, and planning units are used in conservation planning. And in this study, we use culinary subcatchments as planning units. We, first then, uh, we also then had to um, assign a state to each planning unit. In, in other words, a condition of each parcel of land based on land cover classes and protected area um, status. We then assigned planning unit um, uh, zones based on the initial state of that planning unit calculated the possible maximum that could be derived from the planning unit or a parcel of land if it could be restored to a state where it could contribute to conservation. And then we determined the livestock production potential of each livestock production, assigning planning unit costs based on foregone benefits from livestock production. Um, we then assigned zone contributions to all of the targets that we looked at, and finally I ran a few scenarios. I will unpack each of these points, uh, trying to um, emphasize the important ones. Firstly, we decided on a planning unit, and the Engangala grassland was broken down into units, so we could be able to say there's so much of that in this parcel of land. Secondly, I took the national land cover and I unioned it with the protected areas so that could, at least I could be able to identify different states and four states with, where I had defined from the national land cover. I defined natural areas, degraded areas, transformed areas and protected areas. Degraded areas, these I just in, uh, Define them uh, from the dongas and the galleys on the national land cover and transformed areas included mined areas and cultivated areas. Protected areas were areas which were under formal cons conservation and all parcels of land or planning unit that contained greater than 50% forest and were greater than 50% transformed. I excluded them completely from the analysis because I, I just thought that they could not be restored to any state where they could contribute to any of the objectives. I then assigned each parcel of land or a planning unit to a zone based on its initial state. Here I will try and explain a bit. If a planning unit or a parcel of land was protected formally, it was locked to be protected, so it could not go to any other zone other than protected. And all natural planning unit could then be used uh, as a free range zone, in other ways, stocking livestock at, at the land's carrying capacity. And that land use zone could transition in the future to any other zone. So it could go to protected, it could go to free range, or go to transform. And transformed areas could transition to a feedlot. This is hypothetical. Say, given that we need to have feedlots in the grasslands, what will the area look like? So I said, then if all the areas that were transformed could be then in the future transition to a feedlot, and what will be the consequences of that? I then went and did a whole lot of maths and uh, did a whole lot of work in the GIS platform and arrived to different uh, features and kind of like how much could potentially uh, be obtained in each planning unit for all the features I looked at. Then I came up with these pretty maps. Vegetation types of the Nkangala grasslands, uh, which I used as surrogates for biodiversity. I then looked at net methane that could potentially be protected in the area, annual blaze flow, and finally net sediment protection that could be uh, obtained in the area. Uh, I then took data on grazing potential for the entire South Africa and I looked at how much could potentially be supported in each parcel of land in the study area so that I could be able to uh, assign an opportunity cost of assigning a parcel of land to conservation and not having livestock there. So each planning unit or a parcel of land had a livestock grazing potential and I defined feedlock stocking rate because I don't know the stocking rate in the Nkangala grasslands. I just 
come stuck to this value and said, what if stocking rate in the feedlots is four times the carrying capacity? How, what, how, what effect would that have? And I, I defined the planning unit cost as four bond benefits from not stocking at, at feedlot capacity. What effect would that have on my model? So basically, I think by now you understand what I'm saying. I'm saying there are three zones. There's protected zones, free range zones, and feedlots, each with different utility. So therefore, they have different function, meaning they could support different patterns of biodiversity and deliver different quantities of ecosystem services. So I went and extracted data for BII, which is the Biodiversity Integrity Index for the entire of South Africa. And I extracted data for the grasslands to see what effect will transitioning a, a parcel of land from being a protected to a very, very transformed state. What effect will that have on biodiversity and ecosystem services? And I did that with all the features that you looked at there. But I can chat to you about what data I used to get to this table a bit later, but it's just going to take long. But what I really want to demonstrate to you that if a planning unit is protected, it has full contribution to targets. But as soon as you transfer it to another zone, like in the free range or in the feedlot, there's loss of integrity. And like say, for example, a planning unit was initially protected and you put it into a feedlot, there's a loss of at least 51%. And if it was a, 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 a protected for animal based flow, uh, moving it to a feedlot will be associated with 13% loss in integrity. And if a, a planning unit had a net sediment protection of 100% in a protected and you put it in a feedlot, that will be associated with 60% loss of integrity. So with this table, I wanted to indicate to you costs associated with transitioning planning units between, between, between zones, which is a situation that's most likely to happen in a landscape where there are different land uses. Um, as you saw, I am not zooming into specific patterns in a landscape. I am not saying I'm making a map showing how much sediment protection will be lost in the grassland if there's so much stock, but to indicate the ability of this tool to uh, as to, to recognize trade-offs, that they, they, they will always be trade-offs between activities zoomed to conservation and those zoomed to development, like agricultural activity, such as livestock. So what I'm showing to you now is more like a data that could be extracted from running a, 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 a software such as Max and with zones. What, what, what data could be could be obtained from that, and it could be tailored into understanding better how trade-offs work in the landscape. So with this map, this is a zone configuration when I'm, when I'm, I'm, I'm targeting 60% sediment protection in the Ingamala grassland. Uh, again, the zones are not important, but what's more important is that you can move beyond saying so much is protected, but say in which zone is it protected. And also uh, recognizing that assigning a parcel of land to a particular zone is associated with costs. So then you could be able to plot costs associated with transitioning a parcel of land into different zones. And finally, work out the contribution of each zone to each of the features that you look at so that you could say so much could be, could be obtained in the protected, but no sediment, not said, no sediment protection could be obtained in the feedlots. You know, to make a case, like, like to make a case to somebody making a decision as to why this area is not suitable for being a, a, a feedlot or in a state of where it's very, very transformed. I hope I have convinced you that this tool has great potential in demonstrating multifunctionality in a landscape. And I also you can begin to appreciate that there's a lot of work and there's a lot of data needed. Data on multiple costs, data on targets and different objectives. And I just uh, will conclude by saying I think there's more need for more exploratory work like this that kind of like try to demonstrate costs and benefits between conservation and development in multifunctional landscapes so that we could better understand our landscape, try to minimize trade-offs, get to a state where we could uh, optimize benefits for a more resilient future. Thank you so much.
questions for Kingiwe? Okay, Kingiwe, thank you.